Hi there, it's John here from It's More Than Just Gaming.com. Welcome. Uh, this video is my introduction to a Game of Thrones The Living Card game, uh, which, and, which is currently in its second edition. Um, I'm going to be going through the basic mechanics of the game so that you can understand it. I will be using mostly a Lannister deck, even although I tend to play Greyjoys in this game, but I'm using Lannister cards for the most part in this example, as you can see on screen just now. So you can see Tywin Lannister there, the Tower of the Hand, and there's an Agenda card there, which is the Reigns of Castamere, because if you've got Tywin Lannister in your deck, you really need something that says the Reigns of Castamere. Uh, a living card game is a game where players build up decks of cards and play through challenge phases um, and it's completely customizable. You buy various booster packs and whatnot to build the custom deck that you want so no two decks will theoretically be the same although I suspect there will be a fair amount of similarity in tournament style decks. The difference between it and something like Magic the Gathering is you know exactly what you're getting in any given pack uh, rather than the random pot luck, which takes a little bit of the surprise and the fun away from that, but it also takes a bit of the cost away when you're trying to put together a specific deck of your choice. So, without further ado, uh, let's get on with looking at the rest of the game. Okay, so you'll need to bear with me. I'm adding audio after I recorded this to give you some better quality, so at the minute the screen's fairly static and I can't help that. Um, in this game, you have a deck of cards for that is your draw deck. There's no upper limit to the size. You really, I, I think you need to have at least 50 cards in it. Um, 60 to 75 is about your optimum level. Anything after that's too wieldly, unwieldy. You will have a faction that you choose. So for the purpose of this video, I've chosen Lannister. Um, you can also actually take an agenda card. You don't need to take an agenda card, but you can. Some agendas allow you to bring in uh, cards from other factions. I've chosen one called the Reigns of Castamere because it uh, gives you an ability to um, use schemes a lot. Uh, and it seemed appropriate since this was a Tywin Lannister style deck. So you start the game with a hand of seven cards. I've got a hand on display there, although not a particularly well displayed hand, I have to say, and I can't do anything about that just now. Sorry. Um, in your deck, you will have cards that are um, faction cards. So for instance, the Lannisport Moneylender there you can see on the right is a faction card. In the middle there that you can't quite see just now is the Gold Cloaks. That's also a faction card. On the second and third from the left, you've got Littlefinger and Varys. They are neutral cards. Um, factions uh, can have neutral cards, and I like to only put in neutral cards that are appropriate to the story. So Littlefinger and Varys, I'm toying with the idea of them, but they'll probably go because actually it's a Tywin Lannister deck, and I actually just like Tywin stuff. Uh, so you have characters. You have locations, so for instance, um, like Casterly Rock's a location, Lannisport is a location. You have non-unique characters, which are like armies and things like that. So for instance, the Lannisport Guards or the Red Cloaks and the Gold Cloaks. You can have events, which are things like um, dreams or betrayal and treachery or uh, people being paid off by the Lannisters, which is, are really cool events that you can do. There you can see Tywin there with his golden sideburns. You've got a clearer view of Varys uh, and a clearer view of the gold cloaks. Um, so let's get moving on to the plot decks. So each turn you reveal a plot card, uh, which reveals a little bit of your um, deck's story. So let's have a look at Wardens of the West. Uh, there are a number of um, numbers on it next to Wardens of the West. You've got five in a gold circle. That's how much money that you get uh, for playing this plot. In the brown diamond, it says number four. Four is your initiative, which uh, the person with the highest number in initiative chooses who goes first. And in the grey hexagon, that's your claim value. So for whenever you initiate a challenge um, and you win, you have one level of the effect. So you kill one character or make the opponent discard one card. And then you also actually have some text on the card which will basically let you know what special ability you have this turn. In the bottom right hand of the card, you can't see on Wardens of the West, but if you look at reinforcements, there's a red corner. Uh, and in reinforcements, it says six. That is your hand size at the end of the turn. You cannot have more cards in your hand than that at the end of the turn or else you must actually discard them. So Wardens of the West is actually quite a good one for 
well, it's a specifically Lannister one, which allows you to make force a player to discard more and more cards so long as you've got money. But then the Lannister decks don't tend to have any problems with money anyway. Let's have a look at the Small Council. The Small Council is a mechanic that is added to this game when you're playing with more than two players. You don't do this mechanic when there's only two players. That becomes a Joust-style game. In the three-player plus game, which is a melee, uh, at the start of, um, or during the plot phase where you reveal your plot card in the game, you draw at random one of the Small Council cards, which could be the Master of Laws, the Master of Ships, the Hand of the King, the Master of Whisperers. Each of these has a bonus... Um, like for instance you can see Hand of the King has a bonus to plus one strength when you're doing power challenges that's what the blue symbol with the crown is and it tells you this is who you support this turn and this is who you rival this turn and you get a special ability um, this basically represents I think the fickle nature of politics and temporary alliances and having to focus on an enemy that perhaps you hadn't planned on focusing this turn uh, and actually needing to make temporary alliances that you really didn't want to make but you have no choice i personally prefer not having the small council roles in it but they do actually add a level of chance uh, that, that really does actually represent the fickle nature of politics so that is quite cool in that respect so once you have your revealed plot card uh which in this case we're sticking with wardens of the west and you've got your um your small council card you then draw two cards and add them to your starting hand of seven and then it's on to the marshalling phase so let's draw two cards oh we've got cersei lannister there and the side of my face and the pin for the hand of the king um we then look at how much gold we've got we've got five from wardens of the west and we want to marshal cards so we we're gonna pay for the lannisport money lender which uh costs one gold or two gold i can't remember um, and we still have money left over, so let's have a look at what else we've got there. Can we marshal anything else? Oh, let's zoom in. You'll have to apologise. The I think the curtains were still open at this point, and you can't see that very well, but that's the Lannisport moneylender. We're going to marshal something else. We're going to put in the Tower of the Hand. That costs three gold, um, and that's our marshalling and draw phase done with. Okay, I'll come to the challenges section in just a minute, but I'm just actually going to show you sort of like the tidy up at the end of the challenges phase. We need to check uh, how many cards we left in our hand. Got seven there, just counted them. The reserve value on Wardens of the West is six, so I need to discard one, so I'm going to get rid of Lord Val Varys and put him in my discard pile. Possibly not the best choice in the world, uh, but it's the one I've made just now. Um... And that basically brings us to the end of that part of the sort of like the tidy up. I'm now going to go through the challenges, which is a bit out of order, uh, but bear with me. So we'll use Tywin to have a look at the different, the three different types of challenges. On his card, you can see he has the red martial icon, the green intrigue icon, and the blue power icon. And underneath that, you can see that Tywin is strength six, which is the six on the gray shield. He also has a renown word on his card, which means when he attacks and wins, he gets one power for himself, and he gets a bonus of one strength for every gold in his gold pool. Now, the three different um, challenges have different effects in the game uh, based on what your cl the claim value in your plot is. That was the grey hexagon on the plot card. So most of them are claim value 1, some of them are claim value 2, one of them that I've encountered is claim value 0. Um, when you do um, a martial challenge and you win, you would basically declare Tywin Lannister as the attacker. He is strength 6. Um, your, uh, the defender would have to put in a martial defender. If they cannot actually beat Tywin Lannister, uh, then you whatever your claim value is, you would kill that many defenders. In the case of Intrigue, um, if Tywin's declared, he's strength 6, they would need to defend with Intrigue card. See, there he's being declared for an Intrigue challenge. If they lose, they discard um, however many cards from their hand as is the claim value of the challenge. And in a power challenge, you basically steal as many power from the opposing faction as the claim value of the challenge. And since the object of the game is to get to 15 power, that's a useful one to do. 
Another different thing about Game of Thrones, the living card game, uh, that's different from, like, so say, Magic the Gathering, is it, is it has a dead pile and a discard pile. I represent them by red for dead, blue for discard. Sometimes things just discarded from play, and you can play them again from your hand if you've got other copies from them. So, for instance, if I had to discard Littlefinger, uh, but I had another copy of Littlefinger, I could play him. However, if Littlefinger gets killed, and I have to put one copy of him into the dead pile, I can never play him again until I can resurrect him from the dead pile. And not every faction can do that. So that's quite a cool ability, um, and makes some decks uh, that are strongly martial very, very powerful in that respect. Okay, now I appreciate I've jumped around a little bit, uh, but I need to go back to sort of like the ta uh, taxation and dominance phase. Basically, there is a dominance phase after the challenges where you add up the strength of every standing character you still have and add your gold strength. And that is your dominance power for this turn. The person with the highest dominance power gains one power for the faction. And as the object of the game is to get to 15 power or more, then that's um, obviously a desirable thing to win. Uh, once you've done that, you do taxation and standing. Uh, taxation is where all money that you have left over from your plot cards is returned to the central treasury and your cards that are kneeling stand back up unless there's some game effect that prevents them from standing. You also return your title from the small council back to the small council uh, pool in the centre, turn them face down, chump, uh, uh, jumble them up a little bit so that in the next turn you'll be able to um, pick a new one at random. So there's Tywin and Cersei standing back up again. Dominance there wouldn't have been particularly good because I had only the uh, the money left and one gold so that strength two and one gold standing up so dominance power of three so probably didn't win that phase but that's how it works anyway okay so that's more or less it uh, last thing to talk about just now is that different decks of obviously have very different themes uh, the Lannister deck I've been building um, is very much about Tywin Lannister and schemes and events uh, and is very good at doing intriguey things and having lots of money to pay for his schemes and events and also having like spies and gold cloaks that can ambush. Whereas my Greyjoy deck is very much about killing things. It's uh, quite weak against intrigue, but it's much stronger, I think, than the Lannister deck at uh, martial challenges and killing things. Um, they're two very opposite decks, and actually the Greyjoys are very good at cycling... Uh, a, things through the the dead pile they can bring things back from the dead because uh, uh because of the drowned god what is dead cannot die and all that whereas the lannisters it's all about money and politics backed up by a pretty strong army uh the tyrells it's a little bit about money and intrigue um and having access to all the resources of the reach um, but their martial stuff is more to do about with knights, if I recall, uh, supported by the ladies of the court, because the ladies of the Tyrells are always seem to be more potent than the men of the Tyrells. Uh, the Knights Watch are very good at uh, building and defending, if I recall, but they're very weak in terms of money generation, uh, so they could be quite difficult to play uh, unless you've got the right cards. The Dorne, uh, the Martells are seem to be strongest if i recall when they are not player one which means they're almost in a perfect position up against the greyjoys because they have the greyjoys have a lot of advantages being player one so uh, yeah that's just a very brief overview apologies it's been a little bit higgledy piggledy um i hope you enjoyed this video don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you found me through youtube um and there will be a link to my website it's more than just gaming.com in the description below if you found the video through the website thank you for watching um i hope to see you here again soon bye for now